So my talk begins in Japan. I spent some time this year in Japan practicing and also doing some research on the way the Buddhist community is responding to uh, a post-Fukushima world. Um, while I was in Japan in the mornings, I was practicing at an old temple in Kyoto. Uh, the space where we sat every morning was a 300-year-old room that smelled like cedar and three centuries of incense, a smell you can't produce uh, outside that amazing city. And every morning when you sit after the first period of sitting, during the second period of sitting, uh, the old teacher who is in his 80s, who has a bad hip, would struggle to get up from his seat, and he would pull out a stick that some of you might be familiar with, and he would watch everyone's nose down the line. And if you were moving at all during the meditation practice, he would come over, so the theory goes, and you would get hit uh, to stay in line. Um, so uh, I've always had a very good concentration practice. Um, for me, daily mindfulness and washing dishes is very hard. But concentration actually comes quite easily to me. And so I was very proud of this because for the first week, I never got hit. And I would just you know, sit really, really still. Uh, and then in the second week of practice, uh, every morning he would come over and he'd hit me first. <laughs> And then the other monk that was sitting across from me would get hit, and that was it. And then I started noticing that he would actually pick on the people who were in concentration and who were really still uh, to bring them out of it. And it took me a while to catch on to this method, but this was his method. So he would wait for the room to get very, very still, and whoever he could feel was kind of dropping into practice, he'd hit them to bring them back again. And as soon as the sitting was finished, uh, I would get handed a bowl. I was the only uh, foreigner, and there was no English. Uh, well, I didn't know he spoke English. Um, <laughs> and, and I would get handed a bowl, and my job was to go on my hands and knees in this 200-year-old moss garden and collect the pieces of moss that the birds had come to flip over to find worms and look for the piece of moss from that hole scattered somewhere by a bird and go find that piece of moss and put it back on that exact spot. <laughs> and this was my job for 90 minutes every morning after sitting practice. And after two weeks of not speaking to the teacher, he finally came up to me and he said, uh, what's your practice? So I said, my practice is the Bodhisattva vow. As Matt said yesterday, uh, the first line of the Bodhisattva vow is to save all sentient beings. He said, how do you understand the vow? And I said, just doing what I'm doing. And he said, oh, that's not enough. So I said, which I've always wanted to say to a teacher, well, how do you understand it? <laughs> and he said, I would translate saving all sentient beings as taking care of things. This whole practice is just to take care of things. And as he said this, I noticed behind him was this old cherry tree. It was the second week of April. It was blossoming. And if you've ever been to Japan, what they do with their cherry trees is when the branch gets old, they put a crutch under it so that it keeps growing, and then they'll put another crutch under it. And then it keeps growing, and so it's supported. And there's this real respect for taking care of this tree that's aging, even when it's dying. And so he said, after he caught me looking at the tree, that's taking care of things. And then he said something that really surprised me from somebody who's lived his life as a monk in this temple. He said, there, are, there is too much of a gap between the educated and the uneducated. There is too great of a gap between the people who have money and the people who don't have money, and that's how we take care of things. And then he bowed, and that was the only thing he said to me for the month. And I was really struck by this monk who we constantly idealize as someone who's just doing inner work, you know, 
as describing the bodhisattva path as a path of taking care of things in a way where there's no distinction between inside and outside. And we all know that the reason why we don't take care of things is because we're addicted to a life of storytelling. Our culture is caught up in stories, and we're caught up in stories, some of which are helpful, most of which are outdated, chronic, unconscious, and are driving us from behind the scenes. In meditation practice, one of the things we all know while we're meditating is even though we're told to watch our breathing or focus on some particular object, what we're actually watching is that part of the mind that is addicted to telling stories. And when you really follow the end of your exhale, when you really follow the process of breathing, what you start to watch is that the storyteller is quite scared of giving up its job as constantly superimposing itself on whatever's going on in our experience. And to my mind, having trained in psychology and psychoanalysis, that at the heart of what we're doing in meditation practice is not just uh, aiming for liberation or aiming for enlightenment or whatever your vocabulary is. At the heart, it's actually being able to shift, being able to notice our addiction to stories and being able to work with that addiction in such a way where we can open up to what's actually going on in present experience. So less than a year ago in October, we saw after uh, some incredible revolutions in Spain and Tahrir Square, uh, that revolution come to this soil in the Occupy movement in October. And I'm not gonna talk so much about the politics of the Occupy movement, but rather the, the kind of a, a Buddhist analysis of what I saw going on in the Occupy movement, which is walking into Zuccotti Park and seeing a hundred people within the first week in a circle without microphones, which I saw right away as the oral tradition, uh, trying to communicate with each other with hand signals, looking at each other's face, face-to-face -face transmission, debating about whether they should have drumming in the park because the neighbors were getting upset. And I was really inspired by the way this debate was happening and I got involved right at the beginning. And to me, this seemed like a collective exhale. You see, if what we're doing in meditation practice is being able to let go of stories, or not so much let go of stories, but actually see when we're caught in an addictive narrative and be able to drop into something deeper than that, then how does that work, I wondered, at a social level, at a cultural level? How do the same psychological dynamics of meditation that we study internally and individually, how do they apply collectively and socially? And we saw this in the Occupy movement. These people getting together to create not so much a place. Everybody was focused on the place, the park, the tents, the library. That was interesting. But what they opened up was a space that previously we thought was impossible. And in that space, all the parts of our culture that were compartmentalized started to come together. Because this is what happens when you drop a narrative. It seems like it's going to be peace and bliss, but actually, um, all those parts of ourselves that we've compartmentalized, they all start showing up. Mm -hmm. And this is what happened, too, in other Occupy movements, not just in New York, but in Toronto, in Vancouver, in California, that we opened up these urban parks, and who showed up? Uh, people with addiction, people who were homeless, people with alcohol problems, all the parts of the city that we compartmentalize, all the people we treat like garbage, showing up for a meal. So in that respect, there was some deep healing that was starting to happen in the Occupy movement because there was this collective exhale, or what the philosopher Walter Benjamin called grabbing the collective handbrake. Mm -hmm. And in the Occupy movement, it seemed like the culture was starting to exhale by pulling the handbrake 
on an economic system that is out of control, whose shadow is the environment, whose shadow is all the people in this country losing their homes. Rates of homeless that at one level are statistics and at another level are horrible for your immune system, for your digestive system, for your family, for your children. High rates of anxiety in this, cult in this culture. So then what happens when you start to exhale, what happens when you start to let go of old stories is the storyteller finds a way to come back and hijack the process, right? The ego always works like that. It's like Hydra, you know, you cut off one head and you grow six more, you know? And at a collective level, I saw that happening as the media. The media came in and said, what are your demands? Where's the violence, you know? And what are the alternatives to capitalism? As if this is like the craziest thought you could have is, you know, you, you can build carbon fiber bicycles, but you can't think about an alternative to the economy. You know? You're Marxist, you're communist, you know? Uh, so I started to see that what was happening was the, the Occupy movement start to develop, started to develop a real kind of patience where instead of working so hard to come up with demands, there was the senses of, you know, let's just exhale. Let's see how big this thing is going to get. Let's see what's going to happen here. And the media was like the, the, the cultural ego coming in saying, you know, you know well, well, tell us what's next. You know? And it's like this just in the process of grief. You know, if you lose somebody, or you lose something close to you, if you don't allow some space there to actually let the mourning process happen, if you're too quick to find an alternative, you know, you lose someone, you find a new lover, it never works. Well, not in the first 24 hours. <laughs> and, and so it was just interesting watching the kind of media's impatience, you know, and this way of treating the Occupy movement as a protest and not a movement. You know, a protest, you have this idea of what's wrong and what you can do better. But a movement doesn't work that way. And the Occupy people were really impressive at maintaining this posture of nonviolence and also this space for taking what's been compartmentalized and allowing those voices to show up in parks, on the internet, and so on. So it was really interesting to watch this and also to watch the role of technology and to see how Facebook, Twitter, social media sites were incredible at organizing people. There's no doubt about it. But as Malcolm Gladwell said at the time, the revolution will not be Twittered. You see? Because at some level, technology was amazing at getting people there. Just like it's amazing getting a teacher and a student in relationship on Skype. But at some level, you have to put your body there. You have to show up. You have to stand in front of the police. You have to stand in front of those people in the community that you haven't spoken to. So in Toronto, the big issue was it was really cold and they wanted to have a community fire. So there was a native elder named Little Bear who was in his 70s who in the circle said, we should have a sacred fire. And I said, that's the stupidest idea because the fire department's here every day and they want to shut us down because of, you know, they were always coming up with some way, uh, some legal issue. So every day we debated this and the whole community was against me. So I'm this like Jewish Buddhist guy <laughs> and there's like this native elder with everyone behind him and I'm saying like, we can't have a fire. I mean, this is how it's gonna get shut down. And uh, eventually what happened after debating this for four days was this lawyer came and said, actually, there's this uh, legal uh, uh, loophole that I found where a native elder is allowed to build a sacred fire <laughs> <laughs> in an urban space. <laughs> so anyways, I lost. And actually, the fire was incredible. Because what happened was all the alcoholics who were cold came to the fire. But in the native tradition of Little Bear, um, if you're drunk, you can't come to the fire. 
So then the community had to figure out how to deal with all the people who were showing at the, up at the park with substance abuse problems. And this is how we build Sangha. This is how we build community. So um, yesterday, uh, Kelly referred to uh, Thich Nhat Hanh's recent comment of two years ago that the next Buddha will be Sangha. And this is an example of this, this kind of social awakening, this horizontal awakening. And so at the time I heard Thich Nhat Hanh's quote, um, I started questioning, well, you know, what is this term we're using as enlightenment? And so I went to my trustworthy mentor, Stephen Batchelor, and said, Stephen, you know, what happened when the Buddha was enlightened? He said, well, funny you should ask. I just happened to be retranslating uh, that, <laughs> that very uh, um, uh, text. And in the Aripariyasana Sutta, which is uh, a version of the Buddha's enlightenment that I think is not off, I've never trusted the Buddha's enlightenment. There's this sense where it was so clean, he turns on like a Christmas tree, and then he has the four of these and the eight of these. And, uh, but actually, um, this is a really personal description of the Buddha's enlightenment, where he goes to his students, his former students, and here's how he describes his experience. I considered the Dhamma I have reached is deep, hard to see, difficult to awaken to, quiet and excellent, not confined by thought. But here's the kicker. But people love their place. They love, delight, and revel in their place. It's hard for people who love, delight, and revel in their place to see this ground. Isn't that interesting? There's no description of enlightenment. There's no description of transcendence. They're just a description of waking up to what I would say is the first noble truth, to fully knowing the ground. And the ground includes suffering, not only ours, but others. But why don't we wake up as a culture? Because we love, delight, and revel in having a place which you can substitute as a viewpoint. We have fixed and rigid viewpoints. We have fixed stories. And we also know that at bottom, every addiction is an addiction to a narrative, an addiction to a story. So my interest is, as meditators, if we learn the psychological dynamics of being able to drop our stories and actually give attention to what's really going on in this human life, on this ground, on this soil, in this body, then we're waking up. Although, we're also caught culturally in these really deep addictions. And so, how can we take what we're learning in our meditative practices and actually apply them socially and culturally? As David Loy has said over and over and over again, it's not enough to work on our individual greed, hatred, and delusion. We also have to work on our culture's institutionalized forms of greed and anger and confusion. We have to do both. And it's not like you do inner work and then you have an awakening and you do outer work. They're, they're simultaneous paths. You do inner work, you do outer work, and you do your outer work and that forces you to do deeper inner work. In the Occupy movement, it was really uncomfortable because you were always having conversations with parts of the culture that have a totally different view that you do. All kinds of people were showing up. And that requires some inner work. It requires not being fixed in my kind of anarchist ideology or my leftist ideology. I had to be able to drop that to be face to face with people. Just like I have to do to be face to face with all those parts of my own life that I compartmentalize, that we all do. And that's the process of awakening. And so I hope that we can exit this, this horizon we're on right now of this distinction between inner work and outer work and see the two as parallel and congruent uh, and constantly cycling uh, one within the other. You know, nowadays, the, the, when you ask someone how they are, they don't talk about the weather or how their fields are. Uh, they talk about their relationships. 
Within five sentences, someone's telling you about what's going on in their relationship. This, this is kind of, I, I think, a new movement in the human psyche. And we need to move now towards a model of horizontal awakening rather than, I think, an outdated model of vertical transcendence. Because the fish, the forests, our cities, our homeless population, they don't care about your enlightenment. They care about your engagement. And that's how we need to measure practice, about your engagement in your life. Because when you're not attached to self-centered, fixed, and chronic views, you're totally engaged in your life. So, thank you.